Welcome to the fun way of learning game development with Unity 3D. Here are the games we're gonna create in this tutorial. I think that learning game development should be fun and easy. Everybody can do it and I want you to be able to create your own stuff as soon as possible. That's the main goal of this tutorial. This is part number two, so please watch part number one first if you want to be able to follow along. Also, the download link to the entire project will be in the video description. For now, we'll focus on learning a couple of new Unity features and getting some more practice with the features we already know. I want to teach you about prefabs for that. Let's create a new scene. And let's just create a cube. And I'm gonna drag that into the house. Make the ceiling red and this orange, something like that. Now in our assets, let's create a new folder and let's call it prefabs. And if you drag an object like this in here, it will turn into a prefab. Prefabs are awesome because now every time I want to create a house, I don't need to go through that entire process. I don't need to uh, duplicate all of those single objects. I can just drag that house and put it right into the scene, which is fantastic. But what's even better, if I want to modify this now, I can just click on this little arrow here, right next to a house, or I can also double click it here, and this will open the prefab in prefab mode. And as you can see, all of the other houses are gone, and all, all I can see in the scene right now is this single house. Um, that's because I'm in prefab mode. If you wanna go back to the scene, then you just click on scenes right here, that brings you right back. But the cool thing is if you modify this object in prefab mode, for example, if I give the ceiling a different color, for example, yellow, cool thing is all of the houses are now changed. You can even add more objects in the house here. Let's do it like this. And then once again, all of our houses are updated. So this is just an absolutely amazing feature. By the way, you can still customize these houses. You can still change the color here in scene, for example, that is still possible. And now this house just overrides the color. If you select that house and click on overrides right here, you can see all of the things we changed that are different compared to the, to the prefab. And if you wanna go back to how the prefab looks like, you can just click revert all. But in some cases you actually want your prefabs to be slightly customized, so that is still possible. One reason why we also absolutely need these prefabs is because we can instantiate them later on. So for example, if we want the player to be able to build houses, then we can just instantiate these prefabs. That was an important thing to learn, so let's remove all of these houses. Bang! Now the first game we're gonna create as a little exercise is this one, where you have to get the ball into the basket. We will need some scripts from last time, so just to keep working in the old project or copy them over from the old project. First of all, let's create a little bit of a ground plane. Here we go. And now I'm just gonna create a couple of cubes. This is gonna be a removable cube, so let's call that removable cube. We just learned how to use prefabs, so let's turn it into a prefab. Bang. You can see prefabs always have this kind of blue filled cube right here and other objects are grayed out. Now these removable boxes are supposed to fall down, so let's give them a rigid body. Bang. I made a bit of a mistake here, I just realized in editing I should have added that component in prefab mode, so it's on the prefab. Otherwise, if you instantiate another one of these cubes, it will not have the component. Okay, here we go. Now let's create a new script. I'm gonna call that script destroy on click. Basically can remove everything from this and just write void on mouse down, destroy this dot game object. You don't necessarily need to write this. Well, it just looks a little nicer. This basically refers to this object, which in this case is this script destroy on click and we basically destroy the game object this script is attached to. Here we go, when we click on it. Now, if I want this uh, script to be on all of these removable cubes, I'll just click on the little arrow right here, open this in prefab mode and add the script right here, destroy on click. It's automatically saved, so I can go back to the scene and now all of these cubes have that script attached to them. Super useful. Let's see what happens when we click play. It works, I can remove them. So now I wanna create a game where you have to get that ball into a basket. So what I need for that is a basket. 
I'll actually add the rigid body onto an empty game object. This has nothing but a transform and a rigid body. And then here in the, in the children will be all of the geometry. Sometimes that's a little more clean. For example, this allows me to rotate these blocks properly. If you wanna see what happens when I drag one of these blocks into one of these blocks, this doesn't look nice. Eop! Because you're basically dragging a transformed object into a transformed object and that can have some weird effects like that. So we don't want that. That's why I'm dragging everything into a empty game object with the scale 111. This way we don't get any weird artif artifacts like that. And it allows me to create a nice looking basket like this that will act in a phys physically correct way. Let's see if this actually works. Okay, yes it does. Um, only thing I forgot to do is giving this uh, sphere a rigid body. Uh, I obviously don't want that to happen, so what I can do if I don't want that basket and that sphere to fall outside of the level, we can just freeze the C position and I think I also want to freeze the X rotation so this basket can't fall over on this axis. Okay, this looks a little tricky for level one. So how about we put that basket on the ground here and let's see if this is possible. Yes, indeed it is. That's probably a good idea to turn those into prefabs as well. The ball and the basket because that allows us to do level design way more easily in future levels because once again we can just drag these objects in. If we decide to change these baskets, if they are prefab, then we don't need to go into every single level to change them. We can change them all at once. So definitely make sure to use prefabs as often as possible. Whenever possible, turn objects into prefabs. Now I want to detect if that ball has fallen into that basket. And when that is the case, I want to go to the next level so we can finally make a game with multiple levels. So how do we do that? I think the easiest solution to this problem is just to duplicate this ground plane here, move it up a little bit and then just try to detect whether the ball has touched this object or not. Uh, luckily we already have a script that does almost what we want wanted to do and that is this restart level on collision. Only thing we've got to change here is that we've got to go to a different scene. It already has the collision check. It also already checks uh, the tag. So it excludes all of the wrong objects. For example, if the basket collides with a block, we don't want to go to the next level only if it collides with a ball, we want to go to the next level. So that's what this check is for. So let's uh, duplicate that script. And I'll just hit control D and I'll rename it to load level on collision. And we also need to rename it here. And now what seems to be the case is that um, this script is not part of the solution anymore. So there's no color coding. Usually this should be green. Usually this stuff right here should be color coded. If that is a problem, right click onto your scripts folder, open file explorer. And then let's drag our new script and put it in here because as you can see, it doesn't show up here yet. So that is a problem. Let's put it in there. And as soon as we do that, we get our color coding back. Um, another fix to this problem is just to close um, Visual Studio and reopen it. But this is a faster fix. Instead of the active scene, we want to customize the scene we want to load. So let's just add a new serializable field and add the scene we want to load. And then we can just replace this entire thing and just load that scene instead. And I think the ball is the one I'm gonna give the script to load level on collision. Now I can tell this ball which scene we want to load when we, when, I, when we win. Let's just load game three, for example. And we want to check the collision with one of these tags that we can, can apply. Let's give this part of the basket a new tag with add tag. And let's name the tag goal. Now I'm gonna give this the goal tag. After creating that to create a new tag, you just click on add tag and then add it right here on tags. Make sure that the rest of the basket does not have the goal tag because we only want to win when the ball actually touches the bottom of this basket. And then one script we could also use is restart level with button. This is one script we already wrote in the last tutorial. So let's just use that again. And for the button, I usually want to choose R. So here we go. Now, now this is a winnable game. Nothing happens. Genius. 
That's because I have to <laughs> specify the tag here, I forgot that. So if that ball touches any object with the tag goal, then we'll go to the scene with the name game3. Now if I mess up, nothing happens and I can restart the game with R. And if I beat the game, I go into a new level. That's perfect. So let's just create a second level just for funsies. Let's uh, rename this scene to level four, uh, game four, level one. Now let's duplicate the scene exactly and let's now it's named level two. And the level I want to go now from level one is uh, game four, level two. Yes, I want to save that. And here from level two, we can either go to game three or we can go back to level one. Let's just go back to level one, game four, level one. One thing we always need to make sure is that those scenes actually exist in the build settings. So just drag them in there. You can reach the build settings here, build settings, and then just drag those scenes in there. I want to level two to be a little harder. So how about in level two, this basket is on a tower as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Bing! And now we go into level two, fantastic. Come on, yes, bingo, and we go back to level one. So this works, fantastic. In my opinion, the main thing you need right now is more exercise, more practice. So let's just keep making a couple of simple games. I know you're probably still not able to write your own scripts. That's completely normal at this point and we'll probably have to dive a little deeper into that entire coding thing at some point later on. For now, let's focus on what's fun and I think What's more fun than particles and sound effects and a little combat scene, so let's create that. Next up we want to expand our fighting game, so why don't we just duplicate the one we already made last time, this PvP fighting game. All we got here so far is two controllable balls, one with ASDW <coughs> and the other one is controllable with the arrow keys. So let's duplicate that and call it game number five. Let's call that one controllable ball by the way and turn it into a prefab as well. If I fall down here the level already restarts. That's because the ground plane already has a script on it that says restart level on collision. That's one of the scripts we made last time and then as a tag it has the player. Obviously here our controllable ball has the tag player. If you have followed the last tutorials correctly, uh, replicating this shouldn't be all that tricky. So let's create some enemies. And these enemies uh, obviously should be prefabs. So once again, I'm gonna drag that into my prefab folder and also give them a rigid body so we can push them around. Once again, I should have definitely added that in prefab mode, but I will realize this mistake later on. So sorry about that. Let's add a couple one of these and then see what's happen what happens. Okay, actually I think they need to be slightly bigger, otherwise I can't really push them correctly. Yeah, that feels a bit better. If you want it to be easier to push them around, you can reduce their... Here I'm looking for the rigid body, which is not there in prefab mode, because I didn't add it in prefab mode. It's not part of the prefab, so that's why it's not here. Oopsie doopsie. Obviously I need to add the rigid body in here, so... Let's just reduce the mass of them to 0.4. This way it's a little easier to push them around. And now if I manage to push any of these into onto the ground, I want them to disappear. At the moment they just keep rolling. That's not what we want. So let's create a script that destroys them as soon as they collide with something. Once again, we already have a script that is very similar on the ground. Restart level on collision and we're gonna create one that is simply destroy on collision. If you feel up to the challenge, you can create that yourself. Try it out. So let's duplicate restart level on collision and turn it into destroy on collision. Once again, no color coding. So let's open this up real quick and drag that script in here. Let's rename the script properly to destroy on collision. And now the question is, what do we want to destroy? I re just removed that and added some brackets here. Do we want to destroy this object or the other object? And I want to make the script as versatile as possible so we can possibly use it in other scenarios later on as well. That's why I'm just gonna create a serialized field, a bool variable, 
So basically a setting that we can select in the Unity editor later on. Destroy self and destroy other. And then in here, when the tag is correct and when we collide with something, we can just check that setting. So if destroy self is checked in the Unity editor, we'll just say destroy this dot game object. And if destroy other is checked, then we'll destroy collision dot game object instead. So the other object we just collided with. And now the cool thing is we can either put that script onto the ground or we can put it onto these balls. Let's let's just put it onto the ground. Destroy on collision. And we wanna check for the tag enemy. Obviously means we've gotta give those guys the tag enemy. Open the prefab and then add a new tag and give them the enemy tag. And now if you go back to the scene, all of these enemy balls should have the enemy tag and the ground plane should check for this uh, tag enemy. So if it collides with, with anything that has the tag enemy, it should destroy the other object, not itself. Boop, boop. Yeah, seems to work just fine. Uh, I want these things to be even easier to push. So let's reduce their mass even further. Yeah, now they feel nice and light. Okay, very nice. So now these objects are destroyed when we push them onto the ground. Next up, I want to make these enemies attack the player by moving towards him. So I want the enemies to try to push the player off the platform as well. And for that, we're just gonna make a new script and I'm gonna call it accelerate towards. Accelerate towards, ba -ba -bum. let's open that. Uh, once again, it's missing from the solution. So let's move it into that folder. Bum, bum, bum. And I want to have a serialized transform variable that we can use to specify where we want this object to go. And I want to do the same again for the speed. Then we also need a rigid body variable. This is not one we will set in, in the editor, even though we could. That would work as well, but we can automate that. So let's just do rigid equals get component rigid body. And this will automatically get us the rigid body component of this object. And we obviously need that to apply a velocity to this object. So rigid body dot velocity plus equals. And now the direction uh, from me towards the target is trans towards dot position minus transform dot position. That is the vector from me towards the target position. And as I want to control the speed of the myself, I, I'll just normalize the length of that vector and multiply it with F speed. Don't worry if you don't get all of this dot normalized basically just um, sets the length of a vector to exactly one. If we multiply it by any value after that, then that's the new length of the vector. And obviously we also should not forget about time dot delta time. Just to make sure we get rid of uh, differences in playtime execution. For example, if the game is running twice as fast, we don't want to apply uh, the speed twice as often. So this balances that out a little bit. If we would use fixed update, then we could get rid of that. But as we're using just the normal update function here, I'm gonna add that time.delta time in here. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit of a long line. I apologize. In theory, we, you could break that down a bit like this. Me towards target could be this vector, for example. And then we could just say me towards target dot normalized times speed times time dot delta time is what we're gonna add on top of our current velocity. So let's go into one of our enemy objects. Let's tell them to accelerate towards and then for the speed, we're gonna pick something like two. Let's go back to the scene because we actually need to link a scene object here. So let's select all of our enemies and then we're gonna take our controllable ball and drag it in here. So all of these enemies will have a point to move towards if you for forget to put something in here, you will get a null reference exception, a bug basically, and that will appear right here in the console. So make sure uh, trans towards is filled out in all of your enemy objects. And now they're all moving towards me. That is kind of cool. Let's make them stronger. Okay, so finally we got a bit of a challenge. 
I want to keep enemies spawning in here now, so I want a constant supply of enemies, basically. The way we do that is by creating a spawner. Let's create an empty object, let's call it spawner. If we want it to be a little more visible, then we can uh, give it a little icon. Let's just place it somewhere up here and let's create a new script. Spawn. So first of all, I have a serializable field with the game object we want to create. This is where we can fill in the prefab later on that we want to create. Then I have a float variable with time intervals. So here we'll be able to set the intervals between spawning objects, the time intervals between spawning objects. And then finally, I wanna be able to randomize the spawn position of these objects a little bit. For that, we're gonna use a vector three because we want to randomize the position in three dimensions possibly. And I'm gonna call that spawn position jitter. And then the timer that actually counts down. Another float variable. That one doesn't need to be set from the inspector, so it doesn't need the serialized field property. At the beginning, we'll simply set the timer to f time intervals. And then in the update event, we'll simply subtract time dot delta time. This way our variable will count down and then as soon as it's smaller or equal to zero, we will set it to its start value again. So this will restart our timer. Now the only other thing we wanna do in here is to instantiate something and we want to instantiate go create. Then we need to specify the position and the rotation of the object we want to uh, spawn and for that we're just gonna say quaternion.identity Quaternion is the the variable type for saving rotations and quaternion.identity is simply the default rotation, zero, zero, zero. So what's missing here is um, the, the jitter. We haven't implemented that yet. And also this will throw a beautiful error message. I'll show you in a sec. So the spawner will get my new spawner script. And the object we want to create are these enemies a push enemy. And for the time intervals, we're gonna choose something like every four seconds. Let's hit go and let's see if it works. And yes, there's one dropping down, but as you can see, they are not following me. Why are those newly spawned balls not following me? There's a very simple explanation. Let's actually remove all of these old enemies. So see, these newly spawned enemies are not attacking me, so something's wrong. If something's wrong, first place you should look is into that console right here. And what do we have right here? Unassigned reference exception. So basically a null reference exception. I can show you what the problem is. Bang. Here, our trends towards is not assigned. Our player object is not in here. And that is because prefabs cannot have references to objects that are in scene. So here my push enemy, yes, that if I put that into the scene, then it can have a reference to another object in the scene. Then I can link the, the transform of the object I wanna move towards. But if I go into the prefab, in the prefab view, you can see that I cannot assign anything here, or at the very least, no scene object. So what we can do is in accelerate towards, we can check if that one is, is assigned. So if trends towards is equals to equal to null. So that means if it's not assigned, then we can just auto assign it and find the objects ourselves. One slightly hacky way to do this is with find object of type and then for the type we can just use a script that is only available on the controllable ball at player controlled velocity dot transform. So in our accelerate towards script, this is a little bit of a hack to actually make sure we don't end up with a null reference exception after spawning. If trends towards this variable is not assigned, then we'll just simply assign it by finding an object in scene. We'll find one of these components at player controlled velocity and as those scripts are only available on our player object, we can be sure that this line will actually return our player object. So now if I hit play, all of the enemies should attack me again. And indeed they do.
Okay, how about we add our jitter in so they, the enemies don't spawn at the same position over and over again. So here, let's go in our spawn script. Let's create a new vector right here. The difference between initializing a variable here and right in the script is that here it will be available in the entire script and if you create it here it will only be available in this part of the script until we exit the, these brackets basically. I only need this variable right here not in the entire script that's why I can create it right here. I don't need this variable to be saved uh, until the next frame starts for example. Okay, so far nothing has changed. Um, I set the spawn position to the position of the object and then in instantiate I use v3 spawn position instead of this term. So far everything's exactly the same, but now I can start applying my random jitter to that spawn position. For example, I can say plus equals vector three dot right times v3 spawn post jitter dot x times random dot value minus 0.5 f and I'll put that into brackets. So this term right here will return a random value between 0.5 and minus 0.5 because random dot value returns a random value between zero and one. So if we subtract 0.5 from that, we'll get a random value between minus 0.5 and 0.5. And I'll multiply that with the right direction with a simply a vec vector that says 1 0 0 and the x component of my spawn post jitter. So if that is set to 0 for example then that entire term will be 0 as well. And if that is 10 then you know jitter is gonna be 10 times as big so that just controls the size of the jitter in the x axis and we'll just do exactly the same thing for all of the other axes as well. So forward is the c axis and up is the y axis. Here we go, that's our entire new spawn script. So let's add a little bit of a jitter, shall we? For example, let's try something like 9 and 7. I really want these to spawn in all corners of the map. Here we go, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I'm talking about. Now they're coming from all directions. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, bring it on, bring it on. Oh, it's actually quite hard. <laughs> Next up, I want to show you how to create some cool effects for this game. So if you manage to push down an enemy, I want it to explode. Let's create an empty explosion object. I'm gonna call it enemy death FX and we're gonna add a component to this. First of all, a particle system. Here we go. And now we should see some particles coming out of this. Um, and you scroll down here in the particle system all the way to the bottom renderer here, material. We wanna select one of these default particle materials. And then also I don't want these particles to come out as a stream here, I want them to burst out. So let's go to emission and there are a lot of settings in this particle system you can already see. It's absolutely insane. Right over time I'm gonna put turn that to zero and then here for bursts I'm gonna add something. At time zero we'll create 50 particles and the rest can stay like it is right now. For the shape instead of cone I'm gonna select sphere so the particles will burst in all directions and I'll set the lifetime of these particles to two and the speed to two as well. Then I'm gonna click here on color over lifetime. Check that so it's enabled. And then up here, when we click on that, we can set the alpha value. So at the beginning, I want the alpha value to be at 100% and at the end, I want the alpha value to be at zero. So now, as you can see, these particles are slowly fading out. Uh, let's make them a little faster once again. And maybe I'm gonna change the color to orange or something. So here, that's our effect here, by the way. Duration, that's how quickly the animation loops. If I put that to two, I'll see it very often, but we actually want it to be a lot higher, so let's put it to 10. Also, this particle effect is only simulated when the object is, in, is selected and also when you um, click on play here. What I want to add now is a sound effect. For that, you just add an audio source to this explosion. And for the audio clip, we just uh, need to import an audio clip. Oopsie doopsie, I think that is in prefab. Let's put that into the prefab folder sounds 
and in my sounds folder I'll just import this explosion sound. Now I have a sound in my sound folder and I can drag that into the audio source on my enemy death FX right here into the audio clip spot and then obviously loop needs to be disabled but that's disabled by default so everything's fine. Problem being is if we would hit play now this object would stay here forever. Uh, let's place this somewhere where we can see it and then let's just see what happens when we hit play. Okay, so we can hear the sound and we can see some particles flying away. So far so good, but as you might see if we wait long enough we can see the particle effect again because the object is not deleted, see? Our enemy death FX is still there doesn't disappear and it keeps spawning particles. So let's just write a small script really quick. Destroy after. And if you want, you can absolutely try to write that yourself by now. What we want to do in this script is create a script that destroys the object after a set amount of time. Basically just uh, four lines of code. Serialize field. And then we'll have a timer variable that can be changed from the editor. We'll subtract time.delta time every frame. So that means this timer will get reduced by one second every second or by one every second. And as soon as that timer is smaller than zero, we'll just say destroy this dot game object. So now all we've got to do is add this here, destroy after and I want to destroy this after five seconds. So this is our death FX. We have a particle system on here. Then we have an audio source and we destroy the object after X seconds. Let's put that in our prefabs and hit delete. We don't need that in the scene anymore. Now all we got to do is spawn that when our enemy objects are destroyed. And I think what I want to do is I want to duplicate this script right here, destroy on collision and turn it into spawn on collision. Spawn on collision. Okay, once again, uh, color coding is somewhat missing. So let's hit open folder in file explorer, drag that in here. Got to rename the script up here as well. And then I'm going to rename destroy self and destroy other into spawn self and spawn other. You can rename things by right clicking them and clicking on rename. This way all of the references will be replaced as well. Now obviously we got to add another field because we have to know what we want to create and we want to create a game object. Instantiate go spawn. That's the game object we want to spawn at transform.position with quaternion.identity, which once again is just the default rotation at our own position. That happens if spawn self is ticked. And if we want to spawn the object at the other position that we just touched, we'll just add another collision in front of the transform collision.transform.position that spawns the object where the other object is. Add this component uh, to our ground. It already has this destroy on collision. So let's give it the spawn on collision script. Oopsie doopsies, why was there a one? And then if we touch the enemy, then the other object should spawn death animation. So let's drag it in here. Bang. Enemy death FX will be spawned by the other object if the ground plane hits an enemy. Let's see if it works. Okay, the first two fell onto the ground just by themselves. Pretty useful. Nice, it works. Okay, we're already done creating new scripts for this episode, but I want to prove to you that those scripts are more than enough to get creative and to create a bunch of different games. For example, if we want the difficulty slowly to ramp up in this level, how would we do that without writing any new scripts whatsoever? How could we ramp up the difficulty over time? There is a very simple solution. We just take our enemy spawner and turn it into a prefab. And then we create a new spawner. Maybe make that purple or green so we can tell them apart. And this green spawner will also get a spawner script. 
And it will spawn an enemy spawner after one minute. After one minute and one second, maybe something like that. There will not be any jitter, so it will be created exactly at this position. Uh, let's make, th let's do 31 seconds so we don't have to wait that long. This is how we could ramp up the difficulty. Let's see if it works. Every 31 seconds, this spawner spawner should create a new enemy spawner. And this way we can slowly ramp up the difficulty. I redesigned the level a little bit just so it doesn't look as exactly the same as the game we created last time. And I gave the enemies uh, a bit of a pattern on the outside. Oh, damn, see, I need to survive till the th 30 second mark to see if the spawn rate of the enemy increases. Oh yeah, spawn rate increased. Now you can see that there are always two of these dropping right after each other. Uh, uh. Did the spawn rate increase again? I, I think so. Oh no, I think they got me. <laughs> So what if we want to Im increase the spawn rate of these enemies only once? Even for that, there's a solution. We could just grab this spawner spawner and tell it to destroy itself after 35 seconds. This way it will spawn another enemy spawner after 31 seconds and then it will destroy itself after 35 seconds. And this way um, the difficulty won't keep increasing any longer. So there are already a bunch of different things you can do with this. We could even create a different enemy spawner that maybe creates different and starts creating different enemies, different different kind of enemy after after a certain amount of time. The possibilities are endless. Now, if I want the player to be able to win this game, why don't we just create a goal object up here after a certain amount of time? First of all, let's create a, a goal up there, a sphere, and I'm gonna make that green. So that's gonna be our goal. And then I'm gonna give the goal load level on collision. And if it collides with something that has the tag player, it will load the next level or something like that. And yeah, we could either spawn that with a spawner, but um, some a different solution just came to my mind. We can also just create another sphere around it that protects the goal basically. And we can give that the destroy after script, make that the same color as the wall. And this will be destroyed after one minute. So if we manage to survive one minute, this sphere will disappear and we'll be able to touch the goal and finish the level. So there are already a lot of cool things like that you can do with the scripts you already have. Oh no, if the tag is big letters, do I need to write it with big letters as well? Probably. Damn. Player, Jesus Christ, will you work? Fine, then let's go to this scene because this scene has been added to the build settings. Here we go, bang. The last game we'll create is a very cool one. And the cool thing is we don't need any new scripts, so no more coding. This is basically my way of proving to you that there are already a ton of things, a ton of games you could make with the scripts we have written so far. You have a very cool toolbox now and I want you to start experimenting, start coming up with your own little game ideas. But as the final little exercise for today, let's create this racing game together. So I'm gonna create a player object, give it the player tag, move that player to the beginning of the track. I'm gonna give it the script at player controlled velocity and I want to control this along the C axis. Let's control this with A and D. And now with the camera, I'm actually gonna do a funny thing. Rip. Gonna put it inside this ball. Oh yeah. Same goes for the hierarchy. I'm gonna put the camera into the player. So now just stays inside of the player whenever I move the player. Player obviously gets a rigid body, so it can move physics-based, but it, I will freeze its rotation, so ball won't rotate. So now when I hit play, I'm already able to move to the left and to the right, and I'm just gonna say add constant velocity, so this will be something the player has no control over, and we just steadily accelerate in the x direction by 0.1, or maybe 0.25, something like that. Prepare for liftoff. Let's see if that works. Yes, it does. Just, uh, uh oh. 
Uh, so yeah, let's give the player the ability to restart with R. And then obviously you've got to ask the questions, what if there were objects you could delete by clicking on them? Or what if there are, were enemies following you around? You can combine all of that, so get creative, bring the action on. Obviously another way to prevent the player from getting way too freaking fast is just to ramp up the damping of the rigid body. Here the drag, let's put the drag to 0.5 and see how that affects our movement. Okay, that was 0.5 is already too much it seems. How about we do 0.25 and then increase our acceleration to 0.35. Okay, now that actually feels quite cool. And then obviously if you want we can create a goal at the end as well, just put an object there and if we touch it, it brings us to the next level with our load level on collision script. Nice, that's actually pretty fun. By the way, if you want a different skybox for your camera, so not this background, but a different one, you can just select your camera object with the camera and for example, pick solid color and then I can just pick any color I like. And oftentimes that looks a lot better than the default skybox. And with that, I say congratulations, you've made your first six games. I would say you have officially mastered the basics of Unity 3D. Now all that matters is that you stay at it, keep going, keep learning, there's still so much more you can learn. And I'll obviously try my best to support you on your journey, because I think game development is worth it, there is value to be had, we can make the world a better place, we can make people smile, we can give their lives meaning. And on top of all of that, making games is just super fun and addicting, so keep at it, keep making games. Give up.